Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to fourth week at the Oxford Union. It gives me great pleasure today to welcome Her Royal Highness Princess Basma bin Saud to Oxford. Her Royal Highness is a businesswoman and a member of the House of Saud, the ruling royal family of Saudi Arabia. She is one of the few Saudis who call for liberal reforms in the Arab world and promotes universal education, constitutional reform, women's rights and changes to divorce laws across the Arab world. She is a writer, blogger and an active member of numerous human rights campaigns groups. And now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado from me, I'd like to welcome Princess Basma bin Saud to the stage. Thank you very much. And uh, <coughs> it's been a pleasure coming here, especially if I just came from St. Andrews, Edinburgh. It was a long journey. I missed my trains and I picked up another one and I had to spend seven hours yesterday on the train, cross country. So I saw everything between Edinburgh and here. So it's been a pleasure coming here and relaxing and um, knowing that I'm meeting hopefully the leaders of the future, um, women before men, <laughs> trying to change what men have spoiled over the centuries. <laughs> and definitely uh, uh, writing the history. Uh, there's going to be sometime a history in the future. Because every minute that we spend is going to be a history the next moment. So what is coming in the future, it's, um, we don't know. But I hope for you and for, the ch for my children, that it's going to be a better future than the one we are, ex we are seeing right now. Now, when I came here, I was actually asked to write a um, speech. And I wrote a speech about women's rights in Saudi Arabia and globally. And then yesterday on the train, since I had a long time to think about it, I thought it would be unfair, actually, just to talk about women, since men are also are concerned here. The whole world is changing. The whole world is in a shift, in a global shift. New things are just popping everywhere. And she forgot to say, I'm a tweeter, also. Yeah. So I'm a tweeter. I tweet every day, and I know it's happening everywhere. I tweet uh, uh, you, the youth. I tweet uh, in places where revolutions are just in hand. And definitely, I tweet the people in my land. And what I found in common is everybody has the same problem. And everybody is just going through the same phase, but in a diff completely different way. So I thought maybe I would change a little bit of the speech that I'm going to say today. or well, it's not going to be speech, and I hope it's not, because speeches are forgotten after they are, um, uh, um, they are uh, spoken. So I hope today we will have a little bit of an interaction. It will be just a proposal for you that you might take. I'm, I'm a good in marketing anyway. I'm a good businesswoman. So I might market my fourth law which I'm currently writing. And I've been going all over for the past uh, one year and a half, trying to build on something called the fourth law, uh, the fourth way, the only way. And I hope that this way will be adopted by the youth of tomorrow, which my children will be part of, and it would be a much better future for everybody. Because what I see right now is not a very nice picture. It's an ugly picture. I went all around the world. I went to Africa. I went to um, North America, North. I went to America, Middle East, Far East. And I see the problem the same. And by miracle, yesterday I went to Scotland and I saw the same problem. So I thought, what was happening in the world? Everybody wanted freedom, even Scotland. 
<laughs> they want to actually not be part of England. And I thought that was really a revolution by in its own means, but in a completely different text. So really everybody wants to go back to the roots, not the other way around. Now we were all the time pushing for a global village and now everybody's pushing back to their or own identity and they want to stay very close uh, to, their, to, their, um, uh, to their land rather than just going away. So we are really sharing, everybody is sharing a moment in history. So what do we do? We shake hands, we put our hands together, we look at each other what's common, and we take what's common and we go ahead and putting our plans together rather than seeing our differences that should be normal. Now differences everywhere is abnormal. If you're different from me, it means you're against me. And that is not normal. All our lives, a long time ago, differences were actually a common thing. Now, if you're not the same, you don't have the same haircut, if you don't, you're not in the same, uh, you know, wearing the same colors or with the same, that, that is actually makes a big difference for the others. And I think, <coughs> personally, that we should accept each other. We should accept uh, the colors, sects, religions, and start a dialogue, start a common ground, build on it, and definitely build on a new, um, um, a new way that will, will actually take your generations to the future rather than be stuck in our past, which is full of blood and revolutions. Now that democracy prevailed, now actually people are being killed in the name of democracy, which I don't think it's nice. Republicans have failed, communism have failed, socialism have failed, Islam have failed, crusaders have failed. So I think we should start something new you should start something new. Or I'm proposing for you to start something new that will take you actually to a new dimension along with the cyber world that has created a completely different world where there's no compassion to anonymous. If you're an anonymous, you can kill anybody with a tweet. You can start a revolution with a tweet but you don't know who's behind that tweet and what is behind that tweet. So here, I think, all concerned, women and women, women and men, are, have to put their hands together towards a better future, whether we're in Saudi Arabia or here in Oxford or in Cambridge or anywhere in the world. Since we have the technology, I think you should be starting to do something about your own future and take it into your hands. The elder ones have not done very well for you. So I think you should start something new, a new world, a new way that will actually guarantee prosperity and equality and freedom and education and security for all, regardless of who you are and what you are and whom you belong to. So permit me actually to read some of what I had in mind on the way from Scotland to here. Now, dear members of Oxford Union Society, ladies and gentlemen, the youth of the day of the tomorrow, and I hope the leaders, I really hope that you will be the leaders of tomorrow. Those who know are not like the, the ones who do not know and those who see should light the way to those who do not see. I came today with the title, The Rights of Women After the Arab Spring and Then Globally, talking about women's rights, but for some time now, ideas have been growing in me. And what I have experienced in the past two days do not fit with a given title at all. Right now, there is a 
little to be gained from the dif differentiating the issue of women's rights for men's issues. Women's rights is a branch of human rights. And all our human rights are struggling for oxygen. The bottom line is that we do not get at our rights nor adjust the course we have set ourselves. We will find ourselves in a Bermuda Triangle. Everywhere I go to whoever I talk to, I find that the problems are similar. I've just returned from St. Andrews University where I delivered a speech over there also to the youth of tomorrow. There were strong themes in all I heard when talking to people there. Whether it was the students, the staff, the waiters, the club, hotel and shop owners, and whoever I met on the streets. The bottom line is everyone is unhappy and they want some sort of a revolution in their lives. No matter how they define it, they want some sort of significant change and it is not restricted to gender. Yesterday I had seven hours on a train to get here from, Scot from Scotland. This gave me the time to think and ponder the title. I don't think I should be talking about women's rights now, but our global and universal state. I went to a small shop in Edinburgh selling sweatshirts and quilts. And the shop owner was telling me about whether and how Scotland was going to gain independence. <coughs> I've heard these conversations the world over so many times. In Saudi, the Middle East, and many other places besides. I didn't expect to hear them in Scotland too. But the headline theme running through all of this is freedom. So talking about women is too narrow for me today. This is about identity. We wanted to believe that we were a global village. But really, people want to go back to their roots. And we should allow them to, because this is freedom. And their own narrow interests. Their families, their communities, there is nothing particularly wrong or out of the ordinary in this. However, sharing one's wealth is a very difficult subject. I know my little boy doesn't want to share his toy with his sister. Governments get elected on promises they make about how much or how little they will tax the citizens. This is not a product of today, and that is for sure. Nor of our past, fast-paced and lonely mod modernity. Through the ages, things have always been like this. It's always been like this, but we didn't see it. We didn't have Twitter. We didn't have Facebook. We didn't have the websites. Through the ages, things have always been like this. Empires have risen and fallen. They rise on the promise of justice and equality, but fall on corruption and broken promises. Whether it's here, whether it's in the States, whether it's in Saudi Arabia, whether it's in Egypt. I'm here not because I want to be able to say I have spoken at the Oxford Union. I want to make a difference and to listen as much as I speak. It is opportunities like this today, speaking to your generation, that I relish the most. It's dialogue rather than just speaking. What makes the young generation so special? Why do I believe that you can make the changes? That everyone else seems to have failed in doing, unfortunately. 
because the creation of another dimension, the cyber world, has given you power like never before. It's a weapon in your hand that you should use wisely. A tweet can destroy, and a tweet can make someone win an election. No matter how qualified or not he or she may be, a tweet can start or stop a revolution. The only thing that is missing from the cyber world is who and why. Who really is on the other end of the line? Why do so many choose to be anonymous? You know, there is a group called Anonymous. Is it because they're scared? Is it because they have agendas? Almost as if they were veiled. Now, women in our countries are veiled, and we are pushing for the unveiling of women. So how can I agree with people who are veiled on cyber world? How can I believe who they are if they are veiled? So as much as I push for the unveiling of women in my country, I'm going to be pushing for unveiling the people behind the anonymous and tweets. What invisible strength does this anonymousness sorry, give them? And to what end? Where does the objective truth lie? We need to regulate who we are dealing with. Without some degree of honesty, there will never be good faith in dealings in the cyber world. Online, we can form communities without knowing any, anyone's name or character. Our sense of security, which is the most important thing, is to feel secured. When online is false, I was online and I was actually blackmailed online one month and a half ago. And in good faith, I, th I thought I was dealing with a very prominent figure in Dubai. And then it was, it was through his own website and his own Skype and his own email. But I did not know that it, there was actually a black mirror behind that line. When things are anonymous, then when responsibility and answering for one's action stops, and this will bring nothing constructive to anybody. The WikiLeaks scandal. Of course, everybody knows it, and everybody knows a lot about it. It's been everywhere. Julian Assange exposed what was happening behind closed doors. And for that, he was destroyed. I think so. Because I know what it is like to say the truth. I know what it is like to disclose this truth. And I know what can be concocted for you when you say the truth. So WikiLeaks is one of the examples of being a hero and being exposed and being truthful enough and not caring what's going to happen later on, though knowing you're going to be hurt. You're there online giving millions and millions of people what's going on behind the doors of the governments. And for that, he was destroyed. And so many others will continue to be if they do something similar. But nonetheless, he was honest enough to be there and be, to be unveiled. Whether it is true that he has actually done what he has done, this is another, completely another story. But I think most of the people who do say the truth are being destroyed. And I have an organization called The Lanterns, which I have started a year ago, that 
actually um, makes a platform and uh, protects all the activists who are down working against big organizations like human trafficking, girls' education in, uh, in Afghanistan. One of them was trapped also because she has reached a level where she was actually touching governments and human traffickings. Then she was uh, exposed. She was trapped into being, uh, 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 what do you call it? Um, I don't know. She, they, 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 they've um, uh, uh, accused her of taking the money and using it for her, her, her own end. But definitely, she was reaching to that point where everybody got scared from her exposing big people on the line. Now, everybody who that I'm talking about chose not to be anonymous. Saying what must be said when it's needed is a brave act. Shedding light on murky goings on is a necessary service. In response, so many things to con counteract these actions will be devised behind closed doors, such as my Black Meg case one month ago. A cyber law is needed to protect people who speak the truth that is needed. A lack of, a lack of it allows it to be painted black and destroyed, like the people I'm telling you about. And the other people who tend to be in the white suit and the gray suits are the ones who are going to be actually ruling for the next 100 years or so, if you don't do something about it, all of you. Otherwise, we will all get lost within the web, and not even Spider-Man will be able to guide us through safety. Or like, I don't know if anybody of you is familiar with Poltergeist, the movie that was done about maybe 15 years ago, that little girl who was looking for the light and listening to her mother's voice, telling her, listen to my voice, look at the light, so you can come out of that <coughs> void. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's in my time anyway. <laughs> where, where we sense that we want to be is just there within our grasp, but something malevolent holds us back. Given the scale of the problems, I'm trying to explain, I'm interested in a whole new law, a whole new platform that can span all the different methods and mechanisms that we have tried throughout history. You know that democracy have started in, 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 in Greece and then in Rome and Senate, and Octavius has, has murdered Caesar for some coins. Democracy, democracy has not been bringing us the solution, not because there is something wrong with democracy or what it stands for, but because it simply means different things in different places, and after all, it is only a good, as good as the people who exercise it. Corruption is so prevalent in the world today that it cuts to the heart of all our rights. <coughs> Sometimes democracy becomes a cover story for maintaining the imbalances which brought the 99% out of the streets all over the world. Crimes have been committed in the name of democracy. It is not controversial to say. So the problem is not the global spring, but what comes after. Everywhere revolution and social change has happened, no matter what the best of intentions there may have been, corruption has crept in. We need to come up with solutions. These standards of technology be belongs to your generations. You must come up with the solutions, not us. Not us. Freedom. I put forward the fourth law, a solution which all must tailor to our context. Freedom, security, education, and equality are the basic ingredients of the recipe. Freedom, particularly in an important world, is somewhere where Europe or the States. Freedom so often gets cast as freedom of speech. But in my part of the world, it's much more basic than that. 
Freedom means so much more. It is the key to so many more things. Freedom of assembly, freedom of movement, freedom to associate and organize yourself whoever you wish. In Scotland, freedom means something special to them right now. This is why I was very interested to hear British Prime Minister David Cameron's speech on the EU two weeks ago. He talked about the fundamental changes underway in Europe and need to secure prosperity. When he said we need fundamental, far-reaching change, it was as if, he, as, a, as if he had read not just my mind, but also my speeches. <laughs> For a long time, I have been talking about the fourth way. It's been a year and a half I've been going all around the world talking about the fourth way, a platform, a framework, which can help make this far-reaching change come about everywhere. To me, there are certain fundamentals of life that provide all of us with dignity and composure. To live life in peace, one needs four essential components globally, security, freedom, equality, and education. This is the basis of what I call the fourth way. In terms of governance, security means security for minorities, individuals, and national groups. Freedom means in the areas of faith, speech, movement, assembly. Equality means equality in terms of gender, health, and public wealth. This is about bringing access to opportunity to all. Education means giving the right to be educated to all, regardless of socioeconomic class and gender. And by chance, last month I was in France and I was actually asked to give an advice about gender equality in education. Even in France, they don't have gender equality in education and I was shocked. The fourth way distills rights to their core, so they become a platform that can be built upon depending on the national and social context. One size that does not fit all and how that we have to understand. Of course, the fourth way is a platform to build on, offering a core of rights that we all find acceptable. From there, each, play tail, each place tails it to their particular context. But the problem in the way we have to organize ourselves and the way we all interact together, whether at the international, national, or subnational level. If we have any measure of cooperation or prosperity, it is despite ourselves, not because of ourselves. Our interests are too narrow, too distant from these common interests of humanity as a whole. So when I say security, freedom, equality, and education, I mean that those things should be given fully to men as well as women. This is not to say that women are on equal right basis. Definitely not. With men currently, but more that if the global of the goal of gender equality is to be achieved, men's inadequacies must be addressed also. This means giving women in my country freedom and security within their own homes. And then flowing from this comes the choice to drive on the streets. But the point I'm getting is, at, at it, that is where, where we are undoubted, undoubtedly seeing fundamental and far-reaching change in the world these past few years. No matter what happens, it will not be simply die down after a while and things will go back to what they were. This is why I advocate for the fourth way. It is about actively and constructively seeking to bring calm to the many eruptions by offering all citizens those basic things we all need. Again, I say security, freedom, equality, and education. From there, it is up to the individual and to the countries, communities, and authorities to tailor things according to local factors and cult cultural tastes. Anyhow, how to do it? Is it global con constitution? Basic but worldwide Bill of Rights? 
conferences followed by seminars, roundtables, and plenary sessions. Countries have signed other conventions and treaties that exist, but what then? We have so many treaties. There hasn't been proper implementation in any venture or any actually convention at all in any of them. Neither the UN one, neither the one in Egypt, neither the one that was actually signed by so many Islamic countries. Why would we need so many? Why would, why would we lose our way within so many? We need one which provides a simple bedrock that can then be tailored to the individual context for the finer details. But I should add that in the area of cyberspace, we have a new dimension where we created the game before creating the laws. More work has to be done there than anywhere else. How much time is there before things reach a critical stage of no return? Sometimes the decree of short-sightedness on the part of many world leaders astounds me. The mistakes of the past are all the training they seem to have. Meanwhile, people become more and more desperate while we use our best language and logic to convince them, other, to convince ourselves things are, aren't quite as bad as some might think, but things are quite bad. Medicine only works when prescribed for the correctly identified disease at the right time. Elections, the messengers of democracy in Egypt have not helped. For example, its leaders are still have their heads in the sand, while its citizens are still not given dignity and basic rights. And today they're still uprising on television, you can see that. Not even the smallest of steps towards this goal have been taken, which is freedom and democracy. We need to offer all our citizens these four pillars everywhere we go. Security, freedom, equality, and education. I'm going to keep on saying them until they happen. Because that is the right thing to do. Because that is the wise thing to do. And because things will get a lot worse if we don't. Mutual interest and survival is anchored firmly in doing this. This is the basis of the fourth way binding our interests together based on a simple but all important <coughs> common dominators is the best way of ensuring that our individuality and cultural identities survive in the way that we want them. From this point, the rights of women will fit comfortably with those of men in genuine and substantial unsustainable way. And it would be high time and to the betterment of the entire world. My next project is writing a small manual, which is the fourth way, the fourth law, the only way ahead of us. It is up to you, all of you, and the youth in the world to elect the right people to ex ex execute those plans. It's not our rights anymore. If the youth can accept it, we will definitely see the effect in the Arab world and everywhere. Then women won't just drive a car, they will drive nations. And the, the marvelous movie, The Wizard of Oz, I don't know if everybody knows about it or have seen it. A revolution takes place in the Emerald City. And the women take over. An exhausted man tells the scarecrow, I don't know how women ever manage to, to make, to do all the tasks that performs now, that we are performing now. Which made all the men so tired in the Emerald City. So he answers him and says, perhaps the women are made of cast iron. Thank you. <laughs>